Hello my dear friends, my name is Dr. Nitin and welcome to Perio Basics. In this video, I am going to talk about the recent 2017 classification system for periodontal and perimplant diseases and conditions. Before we go ahead with the discussion on this new classification system, first let's try to understand what were the drawbacks of the 1999 classification system. First of all, the 1999 classification system is quite comprehensive. There are so many classes and subclasses that clinically it is very difficult to remember all these classes and subclasses in this classification system. The earlier classification systems, they were simple, but they did not include many diseases and conditions which were associated with the periodontium. Even the recent 2017 classification system is quite comprehensive, but we can't help it. All the diseases and conditions which are associated with the periodontium needed to be included in the classification system. Second is the differentiation between the chronic and aggressive periodontitis. Now the recent models of periodontal disease progression such as the non-linear model of disease progression by Kahneman 1997 or the multi-level hierarchical and biological systems model by Kahneman in 2008 or the biological systems model by Offenbecker in 2008 or the recently given contemporary model of host microbial interactions for periodontal disease progression by Mellet and Chappell in 2015, all of them, they have one thing in common. Periodontal diseases they do not have a linear disease progression. Chronic periodontitis in its active phase may demonstrate clinical features which mimic aggressive periodontitis. So sometimes it becomes very difficult to differentiate between the aggressive and the chronic periodontitis. Another problem with the 99 classification system was there was no category for gingival and the periodontal health. I'll give you one example. A patient comes to you and you see a recession or the loss of attachment on the canine. But when you go ahead with the history, you will see that the recession is not due to inflammation, it is due to toothbrush trauma. So this case cannot be classified as periodontitis case because the recession or the loss of attachment is not due to inflammation. So this kind of situation has not been addressed in the 1999 classification system. Lastly, in the 99 classification system, there is no category for the peri-implant diseases and conditions. Now, implant therapy has become an inseparable part of the periodontal therapy. And there are so many treatments which are based on implant therapy. So, all the diseases and conditions that were associated with the implant therapy or implant, peri-implant tissue, mucosa, they, were ne they needed to be included in the new classification system. So, they have been included in the new classification system but were absent in the 1999 classification system. Now, these drawbacks are not the only reason why we needed a new classification system. Since 1999, a lot of research has been done in the field of periodontics and implantology. Now, 20 years is a very long time and many diseases and conditions they needed to be redefined. That is why this classification system was the need of the time. Now, let's start discussing this classification system. This is the brief outline of this classification system. Now, if you see, we have two broad categories. First is periodontal diseases and conditions and second is peri-implant diseases and conditions. In periodontal diseases and conditions, we have three subcategories. One is periodontal health, gingival diseases and conditions. Second is periodontitis and the third is other conditions affecting the periodontium. Now coming on to the first subcategory that is periodontal health, gingival diseases and conditions. In this category we have first subclass that is periodontal health and gingival health. In the 1999 classification system there is nothing like periodontal health. Many patients are there which have completely healthy periodontium. Some of them they have been treated for the periodontitis and at present they have healthy periodontium. So this situation has been classified in the present classification system. Now the second class is gingivitis, dental plaque induced. That is the common gingivitis that is the result of accumulation of dental plaque. Now the third subclass in this category is gingival diseases non-biofilm induced. In this category we have all those conditions 
which cause gingivitis irrespective of accumulation of dental plaque. Now the second class in this classification system is periodontitis. Now in the 1999 classification system we have chronic and aggressive periodontitis. Now because of the problems that I have already uh, discussed these two terminologies they were dissolved and one single terminology that is periodontitis was added in the present classification system. Now how do we classify different patients under this category we will be discussing later in this discussion. Now in this category we have three subclasses. First is necrotizing periodontal diseases. Second is periodontitis as I told you and third is periodontitis as a manifestation of systemic diseases. Now the third category in this classification system is other conditions affecting the periodontium. Now in this category we have five subclasses. First is systemic diseases or conditions affecting the periodontal supporting tissues. Now the second is periodontal abscesses and endodontic periodontal lesions. Third one is mucogingival deformities and conditions. Fourth one is traumatic occlusal forces. And the fifth one is tooth processes related factors. Now coming on to the peri-implant diseases and conditions. In this category, we have four subclasses. First, peri-implant health. What is peri-implant health has been defined in this subclass. Second, peri-implant mucositis. Third is peri-implantitis. Fourth is peri-implant soft and hard tissue deficiencies. Now this is the basic outline of this classification system. Now let us discuss all these categories one by one. First of all, periodontal health and gingival health. One of the most widely used method to identify clinical inflammation is bleeding on probing after applying 0.25 Newton of pressure. Now according to this classification system, after probing the complete dentition, bleeding sites less than 10% indicate periodontal health. From 10 to 30% it is localized gingivitis and from 30% or more it is generalized gingivitis. Now according to this classification, periodontal health has been divided into two categories. One is periodontal health in intact periodontium and periodontal health in reduced periodontium. Now periodontal health in reduced periodontium has further two categories. One is stable periodontitis patient and second is non-periodontitis patient. Stable periodontitis patient means a patient who had periodontitis but at present the condition has been treated and the periodontium is free of inflammation. Non-periodontitis patient means a patient who has clinical loss of attachment due to other reasons than periodontitis like tooth brush trauma or any other reason which is not associated with inflammation. Now four levels of periodontal health have been described in this classification system. First of all, pristine periodontal health. Now this is a theoretical situation in which there is complete absence of inflammation. Now because oral cavity is an open cavity and there are always microorganisms in the oral cavity, so this situation is very difficult to achieve. The more clinically relevant is clinical periodontal health. Now in this category we have no sign of clinical inflammation in the patient and there is complete homeostasis between the inflammatory and the anti-inflammatory mechanisms operating in the oral cavity. Third condition is periodontal disease stability which is described in periodontitis patients in which periodontitis has been completely treated, there is no inflammation and all the modifying factors have been well controlled. Fourth situation has been described as periodontal disease remission in which the periodontal condition has been completely treated and all the factors have been controlled but the systemic or modifying factors are still uh, able to modify the disease progression. Now coming on to the dental plaque biofilm induced gingivitis. I have already explained the criteria that is used to differentiate between a healthy patient, a localized gingivitis patient and a generalized gingivitis patient. Less than 10% bleeding sites means healthy patient. 10 to 30% bleeding sites means localized gingivitis patient. And more than 30% bleeding sites means generalized gingivitis patient. Now along with the 
gingivitis associated with dental plaque, certain potential modifying factors have also been enumerated in this classification system. These include uh, systemic conditions like puberty, menstrual cycle, pregnancy, oral contraceptives. Along with this, hyperglycemia in diabetic patients, smoking, leukemia, then we have malnutrition, then overhanging restoration margins and drug-induced gingival inflammation. These all conditions have been enumerated in the present classification system. Now, it is important here to note that the menstrual cycle associated gingivitis, oral contraceptives associated gingivitis and ascorbic acid associated gingivitis terms have been removed from this classification system. The reason behind this decision was that statistically, yes, there is a difference between the gingivitis in these conditions. But when we see clinically, it is very diff difficult to differentiate between normal gingivitis and gingivitis associated with these conditions. So these terminologies have been removed from the classification system. Now coming on to uh, one more important uh, uh, point here, the probing depth in gingivitis patients. Now the probing depth in healthy patients with normal periodontium has been kept 3 mm or less. For patients who have been treated for periodontitis, the normal probing depth has been kept at 4 mm or less. Now why is that so? Now this is because the reason that after we go for periodontal surgery in a periodontitis patient, practically and clinically it is uh, unrealistic to achieve a 3 mm ideal probing depth after surgical procedure. Instead, a 4 mm uh, probing depth after the surgical procedure is a more clinically achievable uh, result after the periodontal flap surgery. So, uh, in normal patients with healthy periodontium, 3 mm or less has been considered as normal probing depth and in periodontitis patients, a probing depth of 4 mm or less has been considered as normal. Now coming on to the non-dental plaque biofilm induced gingivitis. It has been well established that there are certain systemic diseases which cause gingival inflammation irrespective of the accumulation of the plaque and a removal of dental plaque does not resolve this condition. Now conditions like genetic developmental disorders like hereditary gingival fibromatosis or specific infections like bacterial infections, Neisseria gonorrhea infection, Treponema pallidum infection, streptococcal gingivitis, these are conditions, are bacterial conditions. Then viral conditions like herpes simplex, varicella zoster, or fungal infections like Candida albicans infection. Then we have the immune conditions like leucocyte dermatosis, pemphigus, pemphigoids, these are all dermatological dis disorders, allergic reactions. Then we have a reactive processes like epiloids. Then we have neoplasms like erythropoeia, leukoplakia, squamous cell carcinoma, these may cause uh, gingival involvement. Then we have endocrine, nutritional and metabolic disorders like vitamin C deficiency. Then we have traumatic lesions like chemical injury or physical injury which may cause the inflammation of the gingiva. Then we have gingival pigmentation like melanosis of the gingiva. These all conditions have been enumerated in the non-dental plaque induced gingivitis. Now coming on to the second category in periodontal diseases and conditions, that is the periodontitis. In the present classification system, periodontitis has been classified into three classes. First is necrotizing periodontal diseases, second is periodontitis and third is periodontitis as a manifestation of systemic diseases. Now first of all coming to necrotizing periodontal diseases. Now this table describes how the necrotizing periodontal diseases have been described in the present classification system. Now you can see that two situations have been described. First is in severely immunocompromised patients. In adults it may be due to HIV infection or any other reason that leads to a severe immunodepression in these patients. In children severe immunodepression may be due to severe malnutrition or uh, extreme living conditions or infections like herpes simplex infection or uh, measles infection or malaria. Second category describes temporarily immunocompromised patients. Now this situation has been described in both gingivitis and periodontitis and factors like stress, smoking, tooth related factors like crowding 
or closed root approximation have been described uh, in the second category of necrotizing periodontal diseases. Now, there are three forms of necrotizing periodontal diseases described according to the 2017 classification system. First is necrotizing gingivitis, second is necrotizing periodontitis, and third is necrotizing stomatitis. Now, let us discuss periodontitis. Now, the staging and the grading system for periodontitis has been a matter of discussion for a long time. And finally, in this classification system, we have a well-defined staging and the grading system for classifying periodontitis. I have already explained why chronic and aggressive periodontitis terminologies were eliminated from the present classification system. If you see pathophysiologically, both of these diseases have the same characteristics, or you can say that both chronic and the aggressive periodontitis are the two forms of the same disease. That is why these terms, to chronic and aggressive, were eliminated from the present classification system. Now, first, let us try to understand what is the criteria to diagnose a case of periodontitis. Now, two criteria have been given to diagnose a case of periodontitis. One out of these two criteria must be present in a case to be diagnosed as a periodontitis case. First criteria is interdental clinical attachment loss at two or more than two teeth which are non-adjacent. Second criteria is oral or buccal clinical attachment loss 3 mm or more with pocketing more than 3 mm at two or more than two teeth. One out of these two criteria must be present in a case to be diagnosed as periodontitis case. Now this table describe the staging system of periodontitis. As you can see on the top there are stages stage 1, stage 2, stage 3 and stage 4. And in this column we have criteria like severity, complexity and extent and distribution. The severity of a case is calculated by measuring the interdental clinical attachment loss at the site of greatest bone loss. Then we have to calculate the radiographic bone loss and then we have to calculate the tooth loss and the reason of tooth loss. Complexity of the case is described by estimation of probing depth. A probing depth of 6 mm or more is a complexity factor. Then masticatory dysfunction, bite collapse, secondary trauma from occlusion, drifting of teeth, flaring of teeth less than 20 teeth remaining these all are complexity factors and have been described in different stages of periodontitis the extent and distribution of the disease explains the localized or generalized distribution of the disease less than 30 percent it's a localized case more than 30 percent it is a generalized case dear friends everything that i have discussed so far in this video lecture is available in my book perio basics this book is available on my website spareobasics.com and socialpublications.co.in. Now let us try to first understand what is the exact meaning of a stage or the grade of the disease. Stage of the disease indicates the severity of the disease and the presence of complexity factors. Now this classification system is a clinically oriented classification system. So stage of the disease indicates the severity that is how much periodontal support has already been lost and complexity factors which play a very important role in the management of the case and long-term maintenance of the case. The grade of the disease indicates the rate of disease progression. Is it a slowly or rapidly progressing disease? So grade of the disease indicates the long-term progression of the disease whereas stage of the disease indicates what destruction has already happened in the case which we are investigating and how to manage that case. Now there are some tips you can use while uh, determining the stage of the disease. For example, you are doing the clinical examination of the patients, you are checking the pockets and you see that uh, some teeth are missing and if those teeth or single tooth or more than one tooth are missing due to periodontitis, the case is automatically stage 3 or stage 4 case. Now, Secondly, while uh, doing the examination, you see that there is furcation involvement, class 2 or class 3 furcation involvement. Then the case automatically goes to stage 3 or stage 4. Then you have to see whether the other complexity factors are present or not in the case. 
Now this table describes the grades of the disease. You can see on top grade A, grade B and grade C. In this column we have the primary criteria and the grade modifiers. Now in primary criteria which determines the grade we have two kind of evidences that is direct evidence of disease progression and the indirect evidence of disease progression. The direct evidence of disease progression is obtained with the help of longitudinal radiographs over the period of five years. If there is no bone loss over a period of five years then it is grade A. If the bone loss is less than two millimeter over a period of five years then it is grade B and if it is equal to or more than two millimeter then it is grade C. In the indirect evidence of the disease progression we have the percentage of bone loss by age. If the percentage of bone loss at the worst affected site by age is less than 0.25 it is grade A. If it is 0.25 to 1 it is grade B and if it, if it is more than 1 it is grade C. Secondly we have to see the case phenotype also. If there are heavy deposits and minimal or no bone loss then it is grade A. The bone loss commensurate with the local factors then it is grade B and if in the absence of local factors there is severe bone loss then it is grade C case. Now we have grade modifiers diabetes and smoking. If the patient is uncontrolled diabetic then the patient automatically goes to grade C. And if the patient is smoking more than 10 cigarettes per day then also the patient automatically goes to grade C. So this criteria has been given to decide the grade of the disease. So when we are giving the diagnosis of a patient then first we have to write periodontitis generalized or localized then we have to write the stage of the disease and then we have to write the grade of the disease. Now coming on to periodontitis as a manifestation of systemic diseases. Now there are certain systemic diseases like papillon leaf haveris syndrome or the Haim monk syndrome which have periodontitis as their earliest manifestation. So these diseases have been classified in, into this category. Now as per the classification system, the ICD codes that is International Classification of Diseases and Related Health Problem codes should be applied to identify these diseases. Now coming on to the last category in periodontal diseases and conditions that is other conditions affecting the periodontium. In this we have first subclass that is systemic diseases and conditions affecting the periodontal supporting tissues. Now certain diseases they may affect the periodontal supporting tissues independent of plaque induced periodontitis for example squamous cell carcinoma. Now it can destroy the periodontal supporting tissues independent of plaque induced periodontitis. So these all diseases have been classified into this category and these also need to be identified by their ICD codes. Coming on to the second subclass in this category that is periodontal abscesses and endodontic periodontal lesions. Now as you can see periodontal abscesses have been classified in this way. Now there are two situations which have been described in this classification system periodontal abscess associated with periodontitis or periodontal abscess in a non-periodontitis patient. Now all the reasons which are associated with both of these situations have been described well in this table. Now coming on to the endodontic periodontal lesions. Now there are two situations described as you can see in this table. The endodontic periodontal lesion may occur because of root damage or they may occur without root damage. Now when they occur because of root damage it may be due to fracture, it may be due to perforation of the uh, root canal or it may be due to the external root resorption. In case of endoperio lesions without any root damage it may be in periodontitis patients or in non-periodontitis patients. Both of these situations have been categorized as grade 1, grade 2 and grade 3. As you can see in this table both of these situations should be described by their grade. Now coming on to the mucogingival deformities and recession. The most common mucogingival deformity that we see in our clinical practice is recession. Now as I have already told you that this is a clinically oriented classification system. So this is how the mucogingival deformities have been classified in this classification system. As you can see that there are five parameters. First of all recession. Now the Kairos classification has been used in this classification system that classifies the recession as RT1, RT2 or RT3. 
Now, this has been done keeping in mind the drawbacks of the Miller's classification system. Now, the second parameter is gingival thickness. Now, as per this classification system, there are three gingival biotypes or more appropriately phenotypes have been described. That is thin scalloped, thick scalloped and thick flat. One more important thing to be noted here is that the term gingival biotype has been replaced with the term gingival phenotype. Now this has been done because phenotype includes both the genetic aspect of the tissue as well as the environmental factors have also been considered in phenotype. So that's why the term gingival biotype has been replaced with the term phenotype. Now the third parameter is keratinized tissue width. Now this is important because the width of the keratinized tissue plays a very important role in the mucogingival deformities. The fourth parameter is cemento enamel junction, whether it is detectable clinically or not. And the fifth parameter is step. That is a step at the cemento enamel junction, whether it is present or not. So keeping all these parameters in mind, uh, the clinical treatment plan for the patient is decided. Now, there are four situations described in this classification system, but I'll tell you briefly that the patients with thin biotype and where the width of the keratinized tissue is inadequate are the candidates where we have to do an active intervention and we have to perform surgical procedures to increase the width of attached gingiva as well as to cover the recession. Otherwise, in other cases, we can maintain the case and keep them under a stringent follow-up so that we can check out whether the recession is progressing or not. Now next is traumatic occlusal forces. Now in this classification system three different forms of traumatic occlusal forces have been described that is primary trauma from occlusion, secondary trauma from occlusion and trauma to the periodontal apparatus by orthodontic forces. Now, as you know, that trauma from occlusion is a term that denotes the damage to the periodontal supporting tissues because of abnormal occlusal forces. So, all these uh, forces have been considered in this category of the diseases. Now, the su last subclass in this category is tooth and prosthesis related factors. Now, as you know, that tooth related factors like enamel pearls or the anatomy of the tooth proximity of the root surfaces, crowding, alignment of the tooth, position of the tooth, they play a very important role in the progression of the periodontal diseases. Along with this, prosthesis related factors like infringement of the biological width. Now, one more important thing here, the term biological width has been replaced by the term supracrestal tissue attachment. Now, this term supracrestal tissue attachment includes both the junctional epithelium as well as the supracrestal connective tissue attachment. Now coming on to the last section of this classification system that is peri-implant diseases and conditions. Now as I've already explained there are four subclasses in this category that is peri-implant health, peri-mucositis, peri-implantitis and peri-implant soft and hard tissue deficiencies. Now peri-implant health has been described by four criteria that is Absence of clinical signs of inflammation, absence of bleeding on probing and or superation, absence of increase in the pocket depth as compared to the previous reading and absence of any crestal bone loss once there is completion of the bone remodeling after the implant placement. Peri-implant mucositis is characterized by presence of clinical signs of inflammation presence of bleeding on probing and or separation with or without presence of peri-implant pockets. There is no crestal bone loss once there is completion of the bone remodeling after implant placement. Peri-implantitis is characterized by presence of clinical signs of inflammation, presence of bleeding on probing and or separation, increase in the pocket depth as compared to the previous reading, presence of crestal bone loss once the remodeling of the bone has completed after the implant placement. If we do not have the previous data, then we can use three criteria 
to identify peri implantitis first of all presence of bleeding on probing and suppuration presence of pockets equal to or more than 6 mm presence of bone loss crestal bone loss that is 3 mm or more from the most crestal part of the interosseous part of the implant now coming on to the last subclass in this category that is peri implant soft and hard tissue deficiencies as you all know that after implant placement there are various uh, problems that may appear around the implant that may be related to the soft tissue or the hard tissue like exposure of the cervical portion of the implant after the implant placement that is that may be due to the soft tissue deficiency or the hard tissue deficiencies so we have various surgical procedures like soft tissue augmentation procedure or the hard tissue augmentation procedures that we have to do to uh, rectify these problems so all these deficiencies soft and hard tissue deficiencies have been categorized in this subclass of this category so friends this was all about the recent 2017 classification system for periodontal and peri implant diseases and conditions now this is very difficult to explain this classification system within half an hour because this uh, classification system is quite comprehensive so to read this classification in detail you can go through my book perio basics this book is available on my website periobasics.com and socialpublications.co.in a direct paypal link has been given in the description below to buy this book so friends this was all about the classification systems that we have used so far in the periodontics i'll see you next time with some more topics thank you very much